Well, it is a joy to be here this morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thank you for having me. My church is about an hour away from here. And uh, uh, I'm thankful for the ministry of this church. I've been here several times before for conferences in this building and in the previous one. And uh, I'm thankful for Pastor Tom and his legacy, So It's uh, intimidating preaching in front of you. I want you to know that. <laughs> I remember listening to Tom's sermons on many occasions, including every now and then we'd, we'd hear that his health was declining and his health was declining. For, for years, we heard that. And uh, every time we heard it, uh, my wife and I would watch one of his sermons from Sunday, and we decided they were just rumors. <laughs> <laughs> because even the, you know, towards the end there, we watched what may have been his, his last sermon or one of his last few sermons, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, just to see what somebody who is, knows he's going to heaven, knows he's on his way there, and has poured his life out in a church like this. What does he want to say in the, one of the last few times? And he preached on prayer. Uh, I don't know if you remember that that message, but on the importance of prayer and going to your heavenly Father. And it was so well illustrated. Such a powerful sermon. Just to think like that's what's on his heart and mind is the importance of prayer. So I am thankful for this church and for Pastor Gabe. As he said, we were friends in seminary and. Uh, the Stitzingers have been an encouragement to me in my life as well. I know they're here somewhere. Um, so I'm just grateful for this place. And it's a privilege for me to be behind this massive pulpit. And uh, I feel so small behind, <laughs> behind here. Um, you can open your Bibles to Matthew 22, Matthew chapter 22. Uh, this last year and a half has been a lot of controversy about the church's relationship to government and the government's relationship to churches as the government has tried to regulate church and church worship and it has divided a lot of churches where there have been churches that have said it's right for the church to honor what the government says about corporate worship. You know, the government tells you to sit a certain distance apart or to not sing or to not pray or whatever. Uh, and those are the things in the last year and a half. But if you go around the world, it varies. You know, I ministered in uh, Bhutan for a while, which is a, uh, in Bhutan means kingdom of Buddha. And in Bhutan, they require, they, they will allow churches to meet as long as they wear certain clothes to worship. They have to wear the, the nation's kind of uniform is the English word for it. They have to wear clothes to worship and it divides churches there. Should they wear what the government tells them to wear at worship or should they not? Does the government get to tell you what to wear when you go to church? Or in some countries, they might tell you what to preach on. You can preach on whatever you want as long as you don't preach on marriage or as long as you don't preach on uh, taxes or on democracy in some South American countries, the government will regulate churches in that re respect. And so we experienced in the last year and a half in our country, as far as seating arrangements and singing or no singing or praying groups or not. But, you know, the, the question is standard globally. Does the government have the authority to control or regulate or designate church worship? This is a question that is not new for us in terms of church history. It may be new for Americans, but it's not new in terms of church history. You can go back to 410 AD, 410 AD. That was one of the most consequential events in world history, where raiding army, armies from Europe sacked Rome, conquered Rome, um, they, marking the end of what had been the strongest nation in world history, arguably to this day, the strongest nation in world history. The Roman Empire had lasted for over six centuries, 600 years. Uh, it had given a stable language and stable government and stable law enforcement and currency and roads and had regulated much of the world from Ethiopia up through Europe, out towards uh, India, even outpost in England. I mean, it's really hard to exaggerate how influential the Roman Empire was. Six centuries. You know, by a point of contrast, our American experiment has been 240 you know, years or something like that. 600 years the Roman Empire had lasted and it came to a screeching halt in 410 AD when Rome was conquered. And immediately the blame for that went to Christians. Everybody blamed the Christians. For 600 years, Rome had gone along just fine, worshiping the Roman gods, exalting Caesar, their, their leader as a god. And then in the 300s, something happened. The emperor, Constantine, supposedly, I, I doubt the truth of this, but supposedly became a Christian. 
and he allowed Christianity to prosper. Until that point, Christianity had been illegal in the Roman Empire because they refused to worship the Roman gods. And now the emperor gets saved, gets baptized. The emperor makes other people get baptized. And then the whole thing comes collapsing, crumbling down. You don't have to have a degree in history or politics to understand why a Roman citizen would look at this and say, you know, as long as everybody worshiped the Roman gods, we ruled the world. <laughs> Jesus enters the scene and everything collapses. Obviously, this is the Christian's fault. And if you know the story, Constantine, you know, moved the capital out of Rome to a city that he named after himself, Constantinople, to demonstrate Christian humility, I suppose. <laughs> He sent Greek-speaking guards to guard the Latin city, and they didn't want to do that. And I mean, there's all kinds of other reasons that it fell, but people blamed the Christians. This prompted Augustine, who is pastoring in North Africa, to write what has been the one of the most consequential books in church history called The City of God. And I say book, it's massive. It's really 12 different books. I would not encourage you to read it unless you're really fascinated in it and then take a year of your life to read it. But in that book, Augustine makes a basic point that is helpful for us today. Augustine spends, you know, four-fifths of the book, the first 10 of the 12 books, not really even defending Christianity. He doesn't say, you know, I'm sorry Rome fell. Christians will try to do better next time. Our bad. <laughs> he spends four-fifths of the book making fun of the Roman gods. He traces them through the centuries and talks about how the Roman gods have contradicted each other. One Roman God will do this, another Roman God. The Roman gods fight each other. The Roman gods were at enmity with one another. They had no consistent standard of living. There was no consistent way to worship them. Temples would rise and temples would fall. In fact, the zenith of Roman worship was not the strongest point of the empire. Augustine's point is that the Roman gods cannot get credit for Rome's prosperity, nor can they be blamed for its destruction. The Roman gods are a mess, Augustine said, and so don't look at them for any guide in your own life. And then certainly don't blame the change in gods for the fall of the Roman Empire. Augustine's main point in his book is one that's helpful for us to know today and is very controversial then, very controversial now. Augustine's main point is that nations rise and fall independent of their religion. Nations rise and fall because God causes nations to rise and fall. Nations rise when they check each other's evil, and they fall when they are checked by other nations, and it is not connected to the religiosity of that nation. That was Augustine's point. In fact, the last two books of his massive work, City of God, argues that the world can really be seen as two different kingdoms. He calls them cities. There's the city of man, and there's the city of God. And the city of man is the political structure you find in the world. Countries rise and countries fall. That's the city of man. And Augustine kind of has an attitude when he gets to that part of the book of let it all burn. It's, it's man's city. It's the politics of the whole thing. It's not necessarily our world. Now, Augustine understands that every Christian is a citizen of the city of man. We live in two places. You all have a pat. Most of you have a passport at home. And your passport does not say Christian on the front. It does not say city of God. Your passport says United States of America or wherever you're from. And when you become a Christian, you don't turn in that passport. You know, at baptism and, in, in, you know, Bhutan, for example, at baptism, people would break their Buddhist gods. <laughs> when you get baptized here, you don't burn your American passport. <laughs> you recognize you can be a citizen of two kingdoms. But you also recognize that those two kingdoms are different. And your ultimate loyalty is to the city of God, not the city of man. Now, Augustine's point, as I said, it's controversial. He argues that the prosperity of one kingdom is not related to the prosperity of the other. And I say it's controversial now because you see it in election time in the United States, don't you? If only Christians would get their act together and vote this way, then finally we would win our country back. <laughs> you know, never mind the decades and centuries of slavery where Christians had their act together. <laughs> But that's the, that's the story, isn't it? If only all the Christians would vote according to my voter's guide, then we would win our country back. That's a conflation of the two cities, isn't it? If Christians would do this, then the city of man would prosper. 
And we know that's not true. We know that Christians are the minority. The way of the truth is narrow, not the majority. We understand that. Augustine's point is that nations will rise and nations will fall, and it is always tempting to blame the Christians. However, it is God who is sovereign that is in control. And so that raises a pretty basic question. What are the obligations of a Christian who lives in the city of man? And of course, we honor government, we serve government. You know, many people took Augustine's book to argue the opposite point that he was making. Many people took Augustine's book to argue that one person or one group of people should be in charge of both cities. If only the church also ruled the government, or if only the government also ruled the church, there would be no more conflict in the world. This is what the Roman Catholic Church taught. Their takeaway from the fall of Rome was that the capital was moved out of Rome. So if only Rome had been the capital of the country or the empire, as well as the capital of the church, then all their problems would have been solved. This has led to the, you know, the Holy Roman Empire, which was, I'm sure you know the joke, neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. <laughs> But the Pope appointed the emperor. The Pope had authority over the emperor. And the idea was that there's two cities. They have two swords. The sword of government is, you know, the blue lights that pull you over and give you a speeding ticket. The sword of the government can throw you in jail, can fine you. And the, the sword of the church is the sacraments, marriage and forgiveness of sins and burial and all that. And those are the two swords. And the two countries go forward. The two cities go forward under the authority of one person who leads both. This is why the knights had on their, their shields, the two swords, the cross. In fact, I'll show you a picture of a, a common seal. This is a lot of European nations have this kind of seal. It's a, an eagle that has the two swords. Remember, you see the, the church in one and the sword in the other, which means that one person, in this case, the eagle, holds the authority over both, the government and the church. And if only we could do that, it would solve all of the problems in the world. The Catholic Church calls this the doctrine of the two swords. And it lives on to this day, by the way. Uh, it lives on to this day in the Anglican church. The queen is the head of the church. And she's the head of the, you know, it's all figurative. She's, you know, it's merely symbolic. But the idea is that the army has one sword for law and war, and the church has one sword over spiritual matters. They're both held by the same person. This is very commonly taught in the world. A lot of countries follow this way of thinking. Well, our response as Christians is to say there may be two swords, but there's two different streams of authority in the world. God rules nations in the world through providence, through the rise and fall of nations, through conscience, as people are aware of sin and their consciences convict them and condemn them. And God rules the church in the world through the word of God. And the word of God is supreme, of course, for believers the two worlds interact with each other as believers call out sin in the world. Of course, we recognize sin in the world. John the Baptist understood that he was a subject of the Roman Empire, and yet he would still call out the Roman leaders. He would call out you know, the, the leader for marrying his brother's wife and says, that's not allowed. It wasn't that it was against the Roman law. It was that it was against what scripture says about marriage, and John got his head cut off for it. So Christians have the capacity to expose sin in the world by taking the word of God to bear on society. But we recognize that these are two different kingdoms. They're two different spheres of authority. And they're two different cities, to use Augustine's phrase. And of course, they affect each other. You know, you think how much better a country or a culture might be with biblical ethics. That's obvious. You know, our Declaration of Independence is, we all these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. Well, you can't say that unless you believe in creation, right? Can't say all people are created equal and then, but I don't believe in a creator. That doesn't work very well. <laughs> so you recognize that there's overlap in these two areas, but that there is a distinction. The kingdom of God can advance on earth freely through conversions and baptisms. Kingdom of man advances on earth through wars and conquests. Think about how nations grow. Nations grow by conquering each other, by making treaties with each other, by taxing each other, by trading with each other. It's not how the church grows. You know, there's not a mosque down the street and you say, you know, we'll give you a youth pastor in exchange for 10 other people. <laughs> Work out some kind of trade. Sorry about Sean, by the way. <laughs> you recognize those two kingdoms 
advance differently. Differently. Uh, Constantine tried to advance the city of God at the sword. If you know the story, Constantine compelled people to be baptized at the sword. He would conquer new lands and make everybody go through baptism. And he would say, see, I'm growing both kingdoms. The political empire is growing and the city of God is growing because I'm making them all get baptized. But you recognize that's not how the city of God grows. Now, all that story I started in 410 AD. That's after Jesus, 400 years after Jesus. And yet in Matthew 22, you're going to see that Jesus talked about exactly this. Matthew 22 is where I want you to turn your attention, and we're going to focus here for the rest of the morning. Matthew 22 is the last few days of Jesus' earthly life. He's entered Jerusalem the week he's going to be crucified. He has cleared out the temple already, turned over the tables, made a whip, drove everybody out, and then he followed that by teaching in the temple about how God is going to rip the kingdom from the Jews and give it to people that are worthy in keeping its fruit. He compares them to a vineyard. He tells a parable of the of a, a wedding feast where new guests are going to come and be invited because the old guests kind of no-showed it. He tells a parable about uh, a vineyard where God's going to take the vineyard away from the Jews and give it to others who are in keeping with his fruit. He tells the parable about a man with two sons, one who says, I'll do what you want me to, and the other who says, I'm not going to do, but the other one does, and the first one doesn't, and you know, which would you rather be? It's another, he's telling a series of parables about how the Jews are going to lose it all because they're not listening to God. And God is going to take his messianic promise, the promise of the Savior, and give it to others. Jesus is not being tactful here. He's not being nice here. He's flipping over the tables and then comparing people to murderers who killed the son that God sent and God is going to rip the vineyard away from you, referencing Isaiah 5, and give it to people who are who will worship God the right way. And this is where this is coming from. A few days into this, this would be noticed, of course. This is not happening in the corner somewhere. It's in the temple, Passover week. Everybody, Jews from all over the world are flooding to the temple. And you've seen perhaps a creek around here that starts to flood and a tree collapses and blocks the water and the water just backs up and all the leaves back up and the debris backs up. That's what's happening to the temple right here. Everybody's flooding to the temple and Jesus is the tree that fell over the stream here. And everybody's just backed up. He's walking around the place like a panther here. He's owning the place and every, there's massive crowds that don't know what to do with him. Certainly this can't be allowed to continue. I mean, this is the busiest week of the temple all year, Passover week. Perhaps a million people coming there. It'd be like taking over the major shopping mall here on Black Friday. <laughs> you know, like, they might let you get away with that on like, you know, January 2nd, but not Black Friday. You can't take over the mall on Black Friday. Everybody's coming there. That's what's happening here. And Jesus takes over and they don't know what to do. The crowd seems fascinated by him because the crowd doesn't like the Pharisees. The crowd doesn't like the Jewish leaders. Here's somebody who's preaching a different kind of message. The crowd is captured by him. And so the leaders are terrified of him. And so they get together in verse 15 and they plotted how to entangle him in his words. Now, the rest of Matthew 22 is going to be how that plays out. And they, they come up with a scheme. Plotted here is deliberate. They're crafting how to ambush Jesus. They can't just murder him. They're eventually going to fall back on that plan later. But for now, they can't just murder him. For now, they have to get him. This is their thinking. They have to get him to do something that will blow this whole thing up publicly, that will make the whole crowd realize that he's a fake and a fraud, and make the whole crowd return to the Jewish system of worship they had received for decades now. I mean, Herod built this temple 40 years around that, around that time. And for 40 years, they'd been operating with this kind of peace treaty that the Jewish authorities could rule the temple that was built by the Roman government in exchange if the Jews just, you know, stayed out of trouble and honored the Roman government and paid a tax, everybody would be happy. The Pharisees just want everything to go back to that standard. And so they came up with three ways to trap Jesus. And there's three questions. It's Matthew 22, three questions. 
uh, three different groups of people. The Herodians, who are Roman loyalists. They love Rome. They were obedient. They're called the Hero- party of the Herodians, you know, the Herod. They affiliated with Herod the Great, who's dead now, but they still aligned themselves with Rome. The Sadducees, who denied the supernatural, denied the resurrection. And then the Pharisee is going to ask the final question, the lawyer, the Pharisee. So three groups of people, it's significant who those groups are because they're going to trap Jesus in questions that are totally expose their hypocrisy. The Herodian is going to ask a question about paying taxes to Rome. The Sadducee is going to ask a question about marriage in the resurrection. And the Pharisee is going to ask a question, why don't good people go to heaven when they die? Three very important questions that remain to this day, by the way. How does the church relate to government? How does society understand marriage? And what happens to good people who reject Jesus when they die? I mean, three very profound and diff- today there are very difficult questions to navigate, even more so back at this time. So they plotted. These are the smartest people in Israel. They didn't just, you know, they didn't make this up over a latte. Like they spent time scheming, how are we going to trap Jesus? And these are the three questions they came up with. They're very good questions, very complicated questions. All of them are a series of traps. If Jesus says one syllable wrong, he will alienate the crowd. Or if he says one syllable wrong, he could get in trouble with Rome. I mean, these are very difficult, complicated, clever, convoluted kind of questions. They're also very timeless. They affect all of us to this day. Before we look at the three questions, it is worth one more comment on them. We'll, we're only look as we look at the clock. We're only look at one question this morning, but a note on all three of them: these three people have nothing in common. The Pharisees, who are fastidious and devoted to the Old Testament law, the Sadducees, who don't even believe in the resurrection. Like those two people, do not like each other. They don't. They do not get. They're not friends. And the Herodians, who are loyal to Rome, you could not get three more different groups of Jews together. These people have nothing in common except that they hate Jesus. <laughs> the Herodians don't want war with Rome, and Jesus threatens that. The Pharisees don't want to lose control over Jewish worship, and Jesus threatens that. The Sadducees reject anybody who's a prophet preaching about the resurrection, and which Jesus is obviously doing. So these three groups have nothing in common, but they all reject Jesus. It's amazing how people will partner to oppose Jesus. <laughs> Couldn't agree on what to bring to lunch, but they will get together and do this. So the first point of these three questions before we go through them is that we're supposed to fear the hypocrite. Fear the hypocrite. If you're taking notes, that would just be your first point. Fear the hypocrite. These people are hypocrites. We live in a world with hypocrites. They're plotting how to entangle him in his own words. The word entangled there, it's like a web. It's used in Matthew 22, verse 15. They want Jesus to be caught up in his own words. They want Jesus to catch himself. You know, the expression, if you let somebody talk enough, they'll, they'll hang themselves. You give them enough rope, they'll hang themselves with their own words. This is a common tactic at trial for, you know, a prosecuting attorney is get the defendant on the stand and just let him talk. And before he's done talking, everybody will hate him. <laughs> That's what they want to do with Jesus. Just let Jesus talk enough in front of everybody and people will realize what a fake he is. We got to steer the conversation. So first comes the Herodian. Notice how the Herodian starts. Teacher. We know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. You can pause there. Is anything the Herodian said true? (laughs) Does the Herodian believe Jesus is true? Of course not. He's there to trap Jesus. The very first words out of the Herodian's mouth, I mean, I guess in one sense they are true. Jesus does speak the truth. But the Herodian is lying right out the gate. He starts with a big fat lie. We know that you're true. No, no, they don't. If the Herodian really believed that Jesus was speaking the truth, he wouldn't be trying to catch him in his words. If the Herodian really believed that Jesus taught the way of God truthfully, he would repent of his sin and follow Jesus as the Messiah rather than trying to kill him. And he said, he adds this on, and you don't care about anyone's opinion. I don't know if you've ever seen a, anchor or moderator of a debate, ask a political candidate a question, the political candidate dodges it. This is like the oldest moderator trick in the book. You know, what is your view on progressive tax rates? And you're like, I'd rather not talk about that. And the moderator will follow up with, well, 
sir or ma'am, we know that you are bold and brave and you don't care what anybody says about any difficult question and you'll always speak the truth to our viewers. So what do you think about that again? And of course, they're going to answer it. That's the trick they're Herodians trying. Oh, Jesus. You always speak the truth with such clarity and power. We just hang on every word you say, Jesus. And you don't care what people say. Even difficult questions, you'll oppose the whole crowd, Jesus. That's the kind of person you are. So here's, here's my quick question for you. I love it. Quick question. Quick question, Jesus. I love it when somebody comes up to me after a sermon and says, I just have a quick question for you. Can you explain predestination and election, how it relates to free will? <laughs> uh, I see your family's all in the van and you guys are all buckled up and the kids are crying, but I have a quick question. How did the 66 books in the Bible get chosen? <laughs> just quick question. <laughs> Jesus, quick question. He asks, what's his quick question? Tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That's the quick question. So Rome rules Israel. Rome is the ruling authority. Israel doesn't like it. The Jews hate it. The Jews have often rebelled and been put down. Right now they're functioning under a peace treaty. The peace treaty is that the Jews can have their temple and worship in their temple as long as they don't rebel against Roman law and the Romans won't enforce Jewish law. It's kind of the stalemate right here and it's worked this way for decades. The Romans won't enforce the Jewish law. The Pharisees get to enforce that. The Jews won't enforce Roman law. The Romans will have their tax collectors. One tax a year you have to pay at the temple, the temple tax. Those from Galilee do not have to pay it. Jesus has never had to pay the temple tax before because he's from Galilee. He's not subject to this. But that's the question. By the way, the rules, you have to pay the temple tax with a coin. There's a picture of Caesar on it. The Jews hate this coin because they have second commandment issues. Don't have, you know, an image of anything in heaven or on earth. You don't make it. It's, you know, here's a coin with a dude's head on it. That's a violation of the second commandment, especially because they say that Caesar is a God. So if he is a God and he is in heaven, then you definitely, as a Jew, don't want his image anywhere in your house, anywhere in your pocket. You don't want to touch it. On the coin, let me show you what's printed on the coin, by the way. The coin is as printed on as Tiberius Caesar, Divi Augusta, Filius Augustus, which means Tiberius Caesar Augustus, son of the divine Augustus. So the coin that they have to use once a year has printed that Caesar is the son of a God on it. Underneath that says Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest. So Caesar is claiming to be son of God on the coin and the high priest. By the way, the Pope, Roman Catholic Pope to this day on Twitter, his Twitter handle is pontifex. So the two swords doctrine lives on in the Catholic church today, although the Pope doesn't have an army anymore, but he has a Twitter handle <laughs> where he claims to be the high priest. <laughs> so it's still there. Anyway, fear the hypocrite. That's the question is, should we use this coin, Jesus? Are you telling us that we can use the coin that has a God on it that says that he's the son of a God and that he's the high priest? Are we allowed to use that coin? You have to give it to the Roman Government, once a year, they have these tax, tax collectors. The Jews hate those tax collectors. Of course, Jesus does not have to pay this tax because he's not from Jerusalem. He's from Galilee. All those around the temple, many of them do have to pay the tax and they don't like it. So do you see why this is a difficult question for Jesus to answer? If he says, yes, pay the tax, the second commandment's not that big of a deal. It's only the second commandment. It's not like it's the first commandment. It's the second one. <laughs> Or the second commandment doesn't apply to currency or doesn't apply to Roman gods. Or you could picture some kind of language that says, yes, go ahead and pay the tax. Not a big deal. Or the whole crowd would revolt against him if he did that. Or if he said, you know what? Don't pay that tax. Who does Rome think they are? They don't rule Israel. I'm the Messiah. I'm going to be the king and I'm going to end this tax. Then they would, the Romans would come in and kill him. There's no right answer for this question, you would think. That's why they chose to lead with it. You know, they have their, their strongest question coming right out the gate. Jesus is aware, notice verse 18 says, aware of their malice. He sees right through them. <laughs> you know, the whole teacher, we know you're true and speak the way of God truthfully. Jesus just sees right through that. And he says, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? Why are you testing me? You think I speak the truth? Why are you trapping me? You're such hypocrites. You don't really believe what you're asking. Now, this part is really funny. 
Notice what he asked in verse 19. Show me the coin for the tax. Catch why he's asking that question? They're acting like they're opposed to having this. They're acting like it's a violation of the second commandment. They couldn't dirty their hands. And so Jesus is playing dumb here. Can you remind me what's on that coin? Do you have one? (laughs) Right out of the pocket. I thought you didn't like the coin, (laughs) but you're carrying it around. You got to be kidding me. I mean, their hypocrisy is so transparent. And when one of them produces the coin, it's probably on display for everybody. Everybody probably sees through that. Like the guys who hate the coin just, you know, (laughs) have them. And so Jesus says, whose likeness and inscription is on this? And they said, Caesar's. And they identify rightly that it's Caesar's coin. Their hypocrisy is exposed. Second point, fear the hypocrite. Secondly, live in the city of man. Jesus here makes a very practical statement that he gets away with making because of how he introduced it. Very practical statement that you're going to live in the city of man whose likeness is inscription is on this. They said, Caesar's, Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It belongs to him. It's got his face on it. It's his. You can go ahead and give it back to him. You know, you have a phone in Lost and Found, a church. And I've noticed, by the way, that there's Bibles in Lost and Found on Monday. There's never a cell phone in Lost and Found on Monday. <laughs> you can read into that what you, what you will. Somebody comes to pick up their cell phone at Lost and Founds, and, you know, I'll leave some of my cell phone anyway, powered on, and it's got my wife and my kid's picture on it. So even if you don't have the passcode, you can still see my wife and my kid's picture. It's very obviously my phone or somebody, you so you would give it back to me. If you found it sitting on the front seat, you would say, oh, that's, that's Jesse's. And you give it back to me. I wouldn't need to prove my ID to you because my picture is on it. <laughs> that's what's happening here. It's got Caesar's face on it. Give it back to Caesar. If he wants it, give it back to him. Do you recognize the huge worldview that's behind this? As a citizen of the kingdom of God, you are still a citizen of the kingdom of man. And you're expected to operate in the world. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You're going to be in the world. You're going to be around immoral people in the world. You've got to figure out how to navigate that without you being immoral. There's certain obligations that are required for living in the world, like paying taxes. You might not like taxes. You might not like what the taxes are used for. You might have a moral objection to what your tax money is used for. Guess what? You live in this world. Your money that you pay has George Washington's face on it. Give it back to him. (laughs) Send it back to to Washington. It's his. (laughs) Obviously, there's a point where taxation becomes theft. Jesus doesn't go down that road. The denarius is, you know, a day's labor wages. It's a hundred bucks. Call it a hundred bucks. Jesus is saying that's not theft. Your government taxes you. You pay the tax. You don't come with some fanciful excuse to get out of it. You don't say, I'm a conscientious objector to this or that tax, so I don't have to pay it. No, you pay what the government requires you to pay. You don't say, oh, my second home is actually, you know, this rental is actually my second home, so I pay less taxes, or my my private car is actually my work car, so I pay different taxes on it. People lie on their taxes all the time, and it's sinful, and it's wrong. And Jesus is basically declaring that. Your government wants to tax you, you pay your tax because you live in this kingdom of man. You know, you work hard, you make money, You feed your family with that money. What money you have left over, you use to help people and advance the kingdom of God in this world. The kingdom of God goes forward through conversions, but it's fueled by missions and it's fueled by generosity. And this is all described in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, that, you know, your money belongs to the government and it's the government's money. But on the other hand, God has made the world in such a way that you cultivate money by working and earning and you can do good with your money. And that's, that's fine. And so you do both. You live, you're a citizen of both kingdoms. I mean, the government taxes you. It doesn't conflict with your duty to heaven, even if the taxes are used for ridiculous things. You know, you wouldn't build a bridge there. You wouldn't, you know, send a spaceship there, but it's not up to you. (laughs) So just go ahead and pay your taxes. That's Jesus' point here. And it's going to be tough to argue with it because he asked whose picture is on the coin. If you don't like it, then don't have the money. (laughs) Don't have the money, but you got the money. So you go ahead and use it for what it's made to be used for. You're going to live in the city of man. There are some things that belong to the government. 
If you spend time in Romans 13, like I have recently in my own church, you realize there are certain things that are given to the government and they're on the screen for you. Obedience belongs to the government. Submission belongs to the government. Taxes belong to the government. Honor belongs to the government. You're required to honor your government leaders. Love belongs to the government. You're supposed to actually not just honor them, but love them. Man, I wish that one wasn't said there. (laughs) I can submit to you, but do I have to love you? (laughs) Prayer. Pray for your government you're called to, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. Thanksgiving for your government. Man, that's hard, isn't it? It's almost harder in a democracy because you feel responsible, you know? (laughs) But it's what you're called to do. You're called to obey, submit, pay your taxes, honor, love, pray, and give thanks for them. And so if you're not doing those things for your government, by the way, you're sinning. If you're not doing those things, you're sinning because the Bible commands you to do them. You're supposed to render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So you're supposed to fear the hypocrite. Secondly, you're supposed to live in the kingdom of man. But thirdly, you're supposed to worship in the city of God. You're supposed to worship in the city of God. Jesus doesn't end with render to Caesar things that are Caesar's. He goes on and he says, and to God, the things that are God's. The list I had on the screen earlier is not exhaustive of all things in the world. Do you notice what's not on the list? Worship was not on the list. Your affections are not on the list. Your heart belongs to the Lord. Your worship belongs to the Lord. When you gather as a church, that is your worship that is not due the government. You're not commanded to worship the government. You know, you have a church state connection or marriage, so to speak, in the Old Testament. Although they had three branches, the king could not be the high, you know, could not be the high priest, could not be the prophet. You had the prophet, priest, and king dynamic in the Old Testament. But Israel had the the worship, they had the law, the law regulated the government and the taxes and all that. And Israel, of course, was not regenerate. Their hearts weren't soft towards the Lord. They had stony hearts, and so they lost their kingdom first, ended up in Babylon. We read about that this morning in the scripture reading. They lost to Babylon. They lost their religion later. They, you know, the temple is destroyed and they come back and they, you know, it's so sad at the end of Jeremiah, they murdered the Babylonian governor that they got. And then the Persians take over and, you know, they're opposed to Nehemiah. Nehemiah gets the wall built and everything is just a mess. Finally, they get Herod's temple. The Roman government builds them and they're trying to run the Messiah out of the temple. I mean, this thing is a hot mess right here. The whole marriage of the church and state is not functionally working, nor did it ever functionally work in the Old Testament even. And so Jesus here has just finished teaching the Jews are going to lose the the vineyard. It's going to be given to others in keeping with the fruit, namely the apostles. The Pharisees will lose it. The apostles will get it. Peter is going to move into the vineyard and build his own little watch stand there and John is going to be there and they're going to write the New Testament and it's going to go to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit's going to come and the gospel is going to go global. It's not going to be confined to Israel, but Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It's going to be worship that is globally. It transcends nations, transcends politics, transcends political boundaries, transcends ethnic groups, transcends continents even. It's going to go global. That's what belongs to God. Your worship of Jesus Christ is his. Now notice the Pharisees exit stage left now. Do you see this in verse 22? There's just the the paragraphs over. When they heard it, they marveled and left him. (laughs) You would think a follow-up question would be in order like, what belongs to God? Well, they know what belongs to God. If the coin here belongs to Caesar, this conversation is taking place in the steps of the temple. What belongs to God? They're not interested in that question. They don't want to talk about what belongs to God. They're out of there. Their whole trap failed miserably. It's the spider who gets tangled in his own web. It's the bee who stings himself. I spent some time in Central America and there's a certain kind of scorpion there you would kill by hitting it with a broomstick. It's on your wall. And you think, why would you kill a scorpion? Because it's on my bedroom wall. (laughs) And you can poke it in the middle with a broomstick and it stings itself and dies. That's what the Pharisees and the Herodians just did here. They thought they trapped Jesus. They went to sting Jesus. They stung themselves. It's over. They're gone. And that leaves Jesus standing there saying, what belongs to God, you give to him. 
They pretended like the problem was rendering to Caesar. They feigned ignorance like what belongs to Caesar. That's not the problem. I don't think there's people here this morning that are legitimately confused about what belongs to the government. But there are certainly people that are legitimately confused about what belongs to God. Namely, your life, your heart, your affections, your worship. And they have other questions to trap him. You know, is there marriage in the resurrection? And Jesus swats that to the cheap seats as well. <laughs> Followed by what happens to good people when they die. And Jesus handles that masterfully, showing that nobody is a good person. And they leave. But do you remember when they finally arrest him and have a trial for him? Do you remember what they charged him with? They couldn't get any witnesses to agree on anything. The only thing they got two witnesses to agree on was that Jesus said, we should not pay taxes to Caesar. That's what they convicted him of. That is amazing. Did you see that here? He didn't say don't pay taxes. He said pay taxes to Caesar. And you picture the Pharisees going, I heard a not in there. <laughs> is there a not in there? I heard a don't. <laughs> they ended up trying him and convicting him of the opposite of what he said. That shows the problem is not what belongs to Caesar. The problem we have to deal with is what belongs to the Lord. He demands our worship. Our church is his, not the government's. Our worship is to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not the executive, the judicial, and the legislative. <laughs> our churches are regulated by the Lord, and our worship belongs to his. Jesus makes it clear he's not going to overthrow Rome. In fact, he validates their authority. Rome has authority over Christians. You're going to scatter into the world and you better obey your government. You better love them. People say, you know, a lot of communist countries reject the church because they say it's seditious and it leads to people rejecting the government. Well, not really. It is seditious, but not in that way. <laughs> it leads to you rejecting your own life saying, I'm not going to live for myself any longer. I'm going to live for the Lord. He is the one that has my heart. He is the one that has my worship. He is the one that I owe ultimate allegiance to. The proud Pharisee wants to make the problem giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. The worldly Herodian wants to keep what is God's away from God's. And Jesus navigates both of them with deafness and says, you know what? You're both wrong. Christianity shouldn't interfere with your submission to civil power and civil power shouldn't regulate what happens in the church. There are two kingdoms and they don't have responsibility for each other. One does not rise and fall with the other. They coexist. They don't threaten each other. Obviously, if the government tells you to sin, then you disobey government and honor God. If the government regulates your worship, you say that's, it's not for Caesar. But the normal experience of 90% of your life is that the two exist somewhat harmoniously. There will be a time when there is one kingdom on earth, when Jesus returns, reigns from Jerusalem over the nations of the earth, establishes his kingdom for a thousand years. You're not going to have a, you know, an appeals process to the court system with Jesus on the throne. You're going to have a, one nation, one kingdom ruling the nations of the earth. But in the meantime, we wait for our Lord to return. And I just want to address you, draw your attention to the very end of Matthew 22 in our few minutes left together here, the very end of the chapter. Jesus takes a turn. He let everybody else ask him questions. He let all those three groups try to trap him. And after all their traps failed, and you can read the other two traps on your own if you, if you want some time, but jump down to verse 41. When the Pharisees were gathered together, after all three traps failed incredibly, Jesus traps them, verse 43, or verse 42. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Jesus plays their game with them. Hey, I have a quick question for you. You guys always speak the truth. You don't care what anybody believes. What do you think about the Savior? What do you think about the Christ? What do you think about the Messiah? Where does he come from? Whose son is he? Well, they don't know what to say. Uh, the other synoptic gospels let you know they have this big argument amongst themselves. Uh, you know, because if they say that he's from God, that's against what they believe about God. And if they say that he, they don't know how to answer it. So they say, the son of David. 
And he says, how is it that David in the spirit calls him Lord? If David calls him Lord, how is he, verse, and verse, verse 45, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. And from that day forward, nobody asked him any more questions. <laughs> this is the bottom line. You exist as a citizen of this world. And there's obligations that come with that, even obligations you wouldn't choose and you wouldn't design. And even when the person you didn't vote for gets elected, it's, you know, it, you just live in this world. Pray for him, love him, wish the best for your country, regardless of what country you're a citizen of. And when there's sin, you confront it. When there's evangelistic opportunities, you take it. But when it comes to your heart and you worship to the Lord, it belongs to him because he alone this is the prophesied son of David. He alone is the son of God that David himself calls the Lord. Lord, we're thankful that you indeed were the prophesied son of David. The, the Old Testament points forward towards you and recognizes that you are the only hope for heaven. The New Testament points backwards to you because you're the son of God. You came from heaven to earth. And on earth, you led a sinless life, of course. He never spoke a sinful word. He never said something that wasn't true. You saw people's hearts, even when they were disguising their hearts with subterfuge and flattery, you saw right through it all. And you see our own hearts this morning. We know that this is a room full of sinners, that we have sin in our own hearts, that we have failed to love others as we should. We failed to respect our government as we should. We failed to pray for them and be thankful for them as you've commanded us to do. And so we confess our sins, not just in that area, but in all kinds of areas in our hearts, greed, materialism, lust, pride. We, our hearts are filled with sin and we confess that to you. But we also know, Lord, that you, because you were sinless, paid for our sin through your death on the cross. When you died, you died so that we might live. You died so that God's anger at us would be atoned for in your own death. And now you live. You're the only person who can claim authority over worship. You're the only person who can say that all of our worship is yours because you have forgiven us our sin. So we answer what the Pharisees could not. We say you are David's son and you are David's Lord. You come from him because you made him and you're the Lord of heaven and earth. And more than that, you are our Lord. Pray for anyone here this morning who has never trusted you with their heart. I pray this morning they would be convicted of their own sin. I pray this morning they would confess their sins to you. I pray this morning, this very morning, they would believe that you are the sinless son of God. I give you thanks that you save those who believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen.